Hello again. This is SSH Society's Story Time with Dolinda Miller. I'll be reading again from Winter Frost, the first book in the series Silhouette's Quest. Enjoy! Chapter 3 The Curse of the Red Witch It was almost as if the Red Witch had been waiting for Great Grandpa Tudor to leave the world. She had been watching and studying Twisted Oak and its annoying gnome inhabitants for a long, long time. She had watched many of them build up their misguided, pathetic courage and leave Twisted Oak to try and cross the endless gulfs to reach her marvelous castle in the snow, Winterfrost. Good luck! Before those sat little farmers arrived, no one, especially gnomes, had dared to live in her land. She liked it that way. Silly, stinky, tiny, little, curly, dearded gnomes would not do. The Red Witch sat on her throne in the tallest tower of her castle and watched those little sad farmers lose out their pathetic lives through her frozen, icy mirrors. Day after day, she watched them, year after year. She had tried on more than one occasion, 645 times to be precise, to kill them all off by poisoning those big, red, stupid mushrooms that littered their grotesque land. But that stubborn, Tudor family just wouldn't let it be. Drats! There was something about that tallest Tudor in particular that she didn't trust. He knew something. He had a blue aura around him that at times would sparkle and dance. Every time he had planted a tater, an onion, or a baby carrot, it would glow blue. She hated blue. Through her frozen mirror, the Red Witch had watched in disgust as some of the sat little curly bearded gnomes returned from their pointless seven year journey and uh, and told old Hollis that stories about her beloved winter frost. Most of the time he had just laughed and munched on his blue tater chips. In her amazement, she had actually heard the sat sarner known say on occasion, and I quote I'd rather eat Tolly's chits than listen to rubbish at that sun red witch. Ah, the nerves. That old Tollis, I'll teach him a thing or two, proclaimed the red witch in her madness. Coward that she was, however, she waited until Tollis was long gone before she said that. The Red Witch had hoped that whatever the Blue Sparkle was, it disappeared along with Tallis Tudor. She stroked the crest of her favorite horned red dragon. He turned and trilled like a pet Cat. The dragon rolled on his back, halting for a deli rub. 
We need to take a ride, nice Scarlet Beauty. Poisoning mushrooms from the SAR is not going to work any longer. It's time we visit that vile place called Twisted Oak. We'll go there under a guise. Those stupid little gnomes will never know. What color steed would you like to be, nice Scarlet Beauty? Black as jet? The dragon nodded for approval. Very well. And so you shall be named Jet. With a snap of her finger and a slip of her head, the red dragon became a huge black steed with wings. His set locks looked like feathers more than it did they did fur. We'll have to do something about those wings, my beautiful black jet. She snapped her fingers again, and Jet's wings were disguised as an elaborate red robe. Perfect, he whinnied. For myself? Let's see, thought the red witch, as she twisted a long jagged icicle through her bony fingers. She turned to her icy mirror and didn't like what she saw. Her face, which had once been a creamy rose color, had turned to a tailed blue. It was cracked and ancient looking. She could see the veins below the skin, like cracks in a frozen pond filled with dead leaves. Her hair, which had glowed a stunning silver, was now nothing more than shards of dirty ice. How long had it been since she looked in the mirror? She turned away in disgust. No, she screamed. This cannot be. With a snap of her fingers and slip of her head, the red witch transformed herself to the way she looked when she first entered Winterfrost. When she first met the blue witch. When he taught her how to turn flowers into silver and platinum. He showed her how to make seals sparkle with emeralds and gems. She had loved him and he had left her. She had cried for a hundred years and her tears turned to frost. So many years had passed since their parting. Her bitterness turned her icy cold, but now she was transformed. She looked back into the mirror and saw herself with her rosy red cheeks, creamy tink skin, and beautiful silver hair that shimmered in the sunlight with highlights of blue, indigo, and violet. She was dressed in a tail silk green dress and off white lace gown. She placed a crown of rubies on her head and a large red ruby around her neck. She was magnificent. I will be known as Queen Rose. Jet whinnied and pawed in admiration. I will tell those sat little songers that I am the queen for the land far beyond Winterfrost. That I have come to tell them great news about Sallow. Unfortunate to them, however, I'll destroy that Cedric and his family 
and the Twisted Oak Village. I'll make sure that Sallow never returns and that sat little runt is a brother. Sillet never has any tutors. It's time for all of them to disappear just like the others did. With that, the Red Witch looked up at the sacred Duke of Necromancers with a crystal key and carefully hid it under the right wing of jet. She knew it would never be sound. The dragon lowered himself to the ground and ever so gently nudged the Red Queen on his back. She settled on his back and guided him to the edge of the lower balcony that overlooked her beautiful city. The witch teared down and gnarled at what she had worked so hard to create. In the streets and the courtyard far below, her deserted citizens rode atop dragons, insects, and dinosaurs. They worshipped her, and they loved her. At least, that's what she thought. They had erected many monuments in her honor, enormous golden pyramids, and twenty obelisks glared up at her majesty and her brilliance. She would never give this up or allow anyone else to take it from her. Absolutely not. Satisfied, the Red Witch gave Jet a firm kick and the dragon slew from the frozen castle of Winterfrost into an endless horizon of ice and tears. Chapter 4 Taters and Onions The moon was full and cast a beautiful shade of orange across the fields and forests, as it always had during the late summer in this part of the world. Philip so had a full three bags of taters slung across his shoulders while he pushed a creaky wooden cart full of red onions along the stony path up from the garden. A good haul by any standards, and there was still more to tick. It had been a marvelous season. Edward had crawled into the grand twisted oak to sleep. He had a first advantage from his nest. He could only see Philip's room and the front door. He and his sister Ollie had lived in the top of the oak with their family for many years. When the Tudor family began settling other villages, Ollie had decided to leave Twisted Oak and settle in Woodley, where Philip's uncle Sesta lived. Every few months, Edward and Ollie would visit each other and spend most of the time just eating and talking about the old days. Ollie made the most wonderful nutty cakes. Recipe in Appendix 1. Soon, Edward would travel to see Ollie at Woodley. He was excited about going. He hadn't seen his sister for or his nieces and nephews since Ollie had come to visit in the spring. 
It was then that she had told him that she had seen Sallow, but didn't know which way he was going or what he was up to. If he had been coming home, he would have certainly been dead by now. Edward was concerned, but did not want to alarm Sillet. He knew that most people never returned from the quest after seven years. I'll get it straightened out when I see Ollie, thought Edward. Straightened out, out, out. Tired, tired, tired. Had a hard day. Too much chewing. Good night, Oak. Good night, good night. So it could smell Ozzy's tater and onion pancakes recipe in Appendix D. Baking in the kitchen, fire take downstairs. It had to be tonight. He was going to tell Ozzy tonight that he was leaving. Leaving to look for Sallow. Leaving to sign Winterfrost. He went to their room and washed his hands and face. He looked in the mirror and straightened and combed his hair and his pointy brown beard. He had already taken off his work boots before he came inside, so he looked around for his favorite slippers that he had named Suz. Suz, where are you? Come here, boys. My seat are cold. The late summer nights were cool in Twisted Oak. That's what made it a perfect growing season for taters and onions. He heard a quick tapping noise under his trunk. I hear you. Don't hide. I don't have time to play, said Philip. I can't forget to take you now, can I? He looked around for other things that he mustn't forget to take on his journey. A book of maps that great Granor Tali had given to his dad, Cedric, who had given it to him for his 100th birthday, was the first thing he grabbed. It was his favorite book. It showed the land surrounded by water and under the ground that great Grandma told her stories about, as well as the tallest snowy peaks of the great granite mountains. Someone had drawn X's and lines and had scratched words and names that had saved it was time. Strange symbols and runes populated the edges of the mass. Philip had never understood the significance of these symbols, but he nevertheless was intrigued by them. Great Grandma didn't know who had drawn them, but she was sure that it had been inscribed by someone long, long time ago, perhaps a long ago relative, or the Blue Witch. While most of the children believed that the lands that great grandma had told the tales about were fictional and purely for their entertainment, most likely to get them to fall asleep earlier, Sallow and Philip knew that they were real. Although he wanted to, to take many, he knew that he could only take one book the leather-bound, worn book of mysterious mass would have to do. In his leather backpack, he tacked an extra pair of pants, underwear, socks, and a worn blue shirt. In addition, he tacked a small picture of Sallow and his dear Izzy. Finally, a small dagger and slint was added to the inventory for good measure. Who knew 
what surprises crept in the lands beyond Twisted Oak. The dagger would suffice nicely. With a sturdy bit of rope, Philip wrapped up all his gear in his pack, put it on the floor at the end of his bunk, and wearily went downstairs to have dinner. Ivy had been busy checking the tater pancakes and stirring the soup. Onions, no doubt. She was busy chatting to herself and laughing about getting ready for the Sarns Market in Woodlia. Would all the tutors be there? Would some of the dwarves from outer towns come by? Ivy liked the dwarves. They brought interesting leasings and herbs with them. They were very similar to the gnomes, only a little larger, and their beards were longer. Philip did not want to ruin dinner. His dear Ivy. She was so happy and excited. Her face glowed from the light of the fire. Saul was her favorite time of year, and the song is knock it. Always had the biggest turnout then. She gave Philip a quick tap on the cheek. My, 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 aren't you the handsome one? Church Ivy. I'll have dinner on the table, tip top. Oh, no rush, my love, no rush. I'll just have a quick draw outside while you finish up. Philip stepped outside and looked up at the sky. It was beautiful. The late summer moon shone as orange as the pumpkins in his garden. A pleasant glow permeated from the round kitchen window. A night bird cried in the distance as crickets chirped in the yard and fireflies danced about. Stars twinkled and seemed so close that they could be snatched out of the sky. And the constellation Aquarius, distant, mysterious, always peering down and reminding him of his brother. The smoke of Silic's tight seemed to trail right up into the glowing blue stars. Twinkle, twinkle, bright and blue. Do I not, or do I do? Edward had been watching and listening to Philip. He sighed. He already knew the answer. Philip, the suit is getting cold, shouted Ivy through the round window. He must have been out there for longer than he thought. Philip jumped at the sound of Ivy's voice. Coming, my dear, coming, coming. So very sorry. My head. Philip and Ivy sat down at their long oak kitchen table and shared a delightful dinner together. Fire crackled in the hearth, and a warm glow enveloped the pleasant surroundings of their home. Perfection. Ivy had even surprised him with some golden raspberry wine. Very rare and very good. They ate and talked about the Sarnus market and Philip grew weary. He had put the nail on the little table by the door and forgot all about it. After dinner, burdened by his imminent decision to leave his dear Ivy, yet motivated by the love for missing his brother, Philip dropped into his favorite leather chair 
and fell promptly into a deep, uneasy sleep. While Philip was sleeping, Isaac dizzied herself by kicking up around the house. She scurried here and there, humming softly to herself while she worked. Isaac was a slight little gnome. She had teaches and cream skin, starkly green eyes, and hair as red as a ripe apple. Her lips were like little flower petals that fluttered in the breeze when she spoke. Her favorite colors were purple and turquoise, and she wore them well. A purple pointed hat and a turquoise dress were her favorites. As she continued her work around the house, Ivy noticed the envelopes on the table where Philip had left them. Ugh, she thought, bills and bills. Then, to her dismay, she saw the envelope that contained that unmistakable flourish font. A slight gasp escaped her lips. Oh no! What does that crazy warlock want? Please, please, not my Philip. Quickly, she stuffed the envelope in her pocket and walked over to where Philip still lay sleeping. A tear began to well in her eye. He's my world, thought Isaac. I will keep him as long as I can. <laughs>